speaker is Josh Timely, um, author, Chief Marketing Officers at Work. All right. Josh. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So, wow, Chris Reed, that's a tough act to follow. So those of you who are in the uh, previous session with Chris here, he's got amazing energy. He's got some great stuff on LinkedIn. He talked a lot about building your own profile, becoming an influencer, or turning your LinkedIn profile into a tool for you as an influencer. And we're going to build on that here. So a little bit more about my background. I've lived here in Hong Kong for three years. I run an agency called MWI. We do digital marketing. I have a book coming out, hopefully any day now. It'll be available online. It's called Chief Marketing Officers at Work. I interviewed 30 chief marketing officers from companies like PayPal, Spotify, Home Depot, Target, and a bunch of these large brands. And I got to sit down with these CMOs and see inside their brains and what works. And today, we're talking about problems that we have with marketing. How many of you are active marketers? That's part of your title. That's part of your role. I mean, this is a marketing conference, right? So I would assume that almost every hand in the audience would go up. So what do the rest of you do? I don't know. We don't have time. But anyway, so we're talking about marketing. Now, when it comes to marketing, we have a problem, or at least some of us have a problem, which is we put out content, we put out websites, we put out ebooks, white papers, videos. We do all this marketing, we produce all this content, and then a lot of the time, nobody cares. Nobody does anything. We get no results from this. Or we can't track the results. We can't tell if anything's happening from this marketing that we're doing. So why don't people care? Well, there was a report that the CMO Council produced a few years ago, and yeah, it's 2013. It still is rele relevant today as it was then. And here are some of the parts that I found mo most interesting out of this report about what people feel like. So it said, buyers are migrating to peer-based communities where there's P2P co communication, one-on-one -on -one communication, and new sources of trusted, relevant, and credible content and conversation. B2B buyers and influencers are turned off by self-serving, irrelevant, overhyped, and overly technical content. B2B marketers rely on poorly conceived content that doesn't connect with customer needs and concerns. And finally, people are turned off by blatantly self-serving and promotional content. And that was cited by 43% of respondents. So we are producing, as B2B marketers, a lot of content that people don't like. Now, marketing is really simple. It's two things. It's the content, of course, and it's the channel, or how that content gets delivered. It's really easy for people to confuse these two things. So let's talk a little bit more about what is content and what is channel. Now, marketing has not changed since the day of the caveman. Even in the day of the caveman, they had content. Here they are. They're producing content. And then there's the channel, how that content gets delivered. So. We've progressed since then, right, though? I mean, the cavemen, they're there. They're producing art that would exist for tens of thousands of years. But today, we're smarter, right? We've progressed from the age of the caveman to the age of the man cave, where this guy consumes things, produces nothing of value. But thank goodness, uh, just in time, Pokemon Go is here to save the day and keep this guy from dying from coronary heart disease. So. Back to channels and uh, content. So here's marketing at its most rudimentary form, perhaps. So what is the content and what is the channel here? Now, a lot of people would say, oh, the content is the smoke. No, the smoke is not the content. The smoke is the channel. The content is what they're saying with the smoke. So what message are they sending here? Oh, there are enemies over here. There are good buffalo to hunt over here. That's the content. The channel is the smoke. It's the way that they're communicating that message. Now, over the years, we've gone through all sorts of different content and channels. We've got paintings. What's the message here? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's that Guilin is really nice to visit this time of year. But the content is the message. The channel is the painting. That's the method. What's the content here? I have no idea. Here's an old Mac head. Maybe it was some great king. Maybe he wanted to communicate a message to people that, hey, I'm really big and tough. Look at this huge stone head that people made for me. And so the head is the channel. The stone, the sculpture is the channel. The message, which we don't know what it is, that's the content. But apparently, the people back then understood it. Music is content. 
uh, in the US, we used to have the Pony Express. That was how content got delivered. That was the channel. Then we've had the telegraph, we've had radio, we've had TV. And finally, we get to our modern day and age, the World Wide Web. Oh, man, that screen just makes me shudder. Anybody remember those days when that was the internet? It was so bad, 56K modems, that buzzing sound, oh. And yet, that was so far ahead of anything else that we had ever seen before. It was this brand new world. So we've got the internet today. And what changes and what stays the same? Channels change, content doesn't change. The content's been the same for 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 years. We communicate effectively the same things over and over and over again. The channels, the way that we deliver that content is what changes. So then, 50 years ago, it was go out and buy stuff. Now it's stay home and buy stuff. Different channels, TV versus the internet, same message, same content. And we think that we've progressed. We think that, well, in some ways we think we've progressed, right? Now some people look at this photo and they think, oh, people are so, they're so antisocial. Nobody's listening. Nobody's talking to each other. But you go back 100 years and uh, huh, that looks kind of the same, doesn't it? So we want to make connections with people. We want to connect with people. And as B2B marketers, we need to connect with our customers, our consumers, our audience. So then the questions become, what is the best B2B content and what is the best B2B channel? That's it. That's marketing in a nutshell. That's simple. So what, what type of B2B content does your customer want? That's the question that you need to answer to be successful in marketing. Well, according to that study from the CMO Council, your customers want content that is trustworthy, relevant, and credible. What kind of B2B content do they not want? Again, going back to that study, they don't want content that is self-serving, irrelevant, overhyped, or too technical. So what's the best B2B channel once you have the content? We get these charts, most effective and indispensable B2B content marketing channels. And we've got email, social media, website, event, web-based, media sites, mobile, all that, those different things. The effectiveness ratings for B2B tactics, we've got in-person events like this right here. We've got webinars, case studies, white papers, all sorts of different content. What is this missing? The most trusted form of B2B marketing, Google knows what it is, it's word of mouth. Word of mouth is the most trusted form of marketing for B2B, for B2C as well. It shows up in every study about marketing. It's all about word of mouth. But word of mouth is not just a channel, it's also the content. So. B2B brands use referrals too. So here's some interesting stats. 91% of B2B buyers are influenced by word of mouth, 91%. 61% of IT buyers report that colleague recommendations are the most important factor when making a purchase. 56% of B2B purchasers look to offline word of mouth as a source of information and advice. So word of mouth is powerful. So the real question is, do you understand your customer? Do you understand what they really want? Do you understand the content they're looking for? Do you understand the channels? that they want. So if you were looking to understand your customers, if you feel like you need to understand them better, you don't understand them well enough, you might say, well, let's go do a focus group. That'll help us understand them. Or let's go do a survey. That'll help us understand them. Or field research or data mining. And the message that I want to drive home today is you can skip all this stuff. That stuff's good. You can do that. You can get valuable information. Or you can go straight to influencers. Now, when you think about the word influencers, you might think of people who are trustworthy, relevant, or credible, or you might think of this. So these are YouTube consumer-based influencers. You got Michelle Fan, she sells a lot of makeup. You got these other crazy people doing crazy things on YouTube and Snapchat and everywhere else. We often think of influencer marketing as these people. But today we're here to talk about not these people, we're talking about B2B influencers. And there is such a thing as B2B influencer marketing. So how does this work? There are two ways to participate in B2B influencer marketing. First, you can work with other influencers. So let's say you're targeting CMOs. Here are the people who are CMO influencers. You've got all these different people that are the most followed people on Twitter by CMOs. You could go out, you could hire these people to speak at events, you could collaborate with them on content, you can talk to them, bring in, them in to do consulting with you to help you target that audience if CMOs were your audience. 
And if it's a different audience, you can find influencers who affect those people. Or what I'd rather talk about is why not do it yourself? Why not become a, a B2B influencer? Why not create influencers within your company who can do that B2B marketing? So I'll tell you my story. This is how I made myself into an influencer and I grew my business a thousand percent in one year. And my business is B2B. I run an agency. My clients are other businesses. So three years ago, nobody knew who I was. I had been running a business for 12 years. It was moderately successful, but I had no persona online. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody followed me. Nobody care, cared if I said anything or posted anything. And then I got a lucky opportunity. I had a friend who wrote for Forbes magazine. She's a PR guru. And I was sitting down with her and I said, hey, how'd you get that gig with Forbes? And she said, oh, they have this contributor platform where people can write and you publish stuff and you don't get paid for it, but you get to write for Forbes. And, and I like to write and I thought, well, that sounds like fun. And she said, oh, I'll introduce you to my editor and maybe he'll uh, hit you up and want you to write for Forbes. And I thought, oh, that sounds great. That sounds fun. I had no idea what that would lead to. I met the editor two weeks later. He had read some of my blog posts. He said, hey, I like your writing. I'd like you to write for Forbes. And I thought, oh, this will be great. This will be fun. I'll get to write stuff and be more professional than what I write on my blog. This should be a great opportunity. Still had no idea what was in store. So I started writing for Forbes. And I started putting out articles about entrepreneurship and business. And I did not write about what I do because I didn't want to promote myself. I didn't want to do anything that would get me kicked off of this platform. Because so I thought, this is a great opportunity to write for Forbes. I don't want to write about, oh, here's how you buy SEO or here's how you do digital marketing or content marketing because then I'll be promoting myself and they'll get rid of me. But after a few months, I noticed that all these other guys on Forbes who are digital marketers, that's all they wrote about was what they did. And I thought, well, if they can write about it, I should be able to write about it. So I started writing articles about search engine optimization and other digital marketing. And a funny thing happened. When I started writing about this, and I wasn't promoting myself, I was just telling people essentially how to do it themselves. I was giving out my secrets and saying, here's how we do this, here's how we do this. People started contacting us and hiring my agency. So then I went out and I wrote this one article called How to Hire an SEO Firm. And in this article, I laid out steps. I said, you need to check references, just basic things about here's what you do to hire an SEO firm the right way so that you don't get ripped off. And again, I wasn't promoting my company. I was just giving people advice. And that article went on to generate literally millions of dollars of leads for my business. It exploded my business. My business took off because of that one article. And I started to make a name for myself. So that expanded and from writing for Forbes, I've been able to write for Entrepreneur, Mashable TechCrunch, Time Magazine, and 10 others. And it resulted in a book deal. And I got to write this book and interview all these great CMOs and that's coming out. So it turned into all this other business, grew my business. It was all through B2B influencer marketing. So some of the tools that I used to turn myself into an influencer. First of all, I've got my blog. That's what started it all. If I hadn't had my blog, Forbes never would have come knocking. I never would have had anything to show them. So if you're going to be an influencer, you need your own website. You need a blog that you can set up where you can show people what you're doing. Now maybe your thing isn't writing. Maybe it's video. Maybe it's audio. You still need to have a blog to get your word out there. I use a software package called ConvertKit. I'm not an affiliate or anything. I just think they make great software. This is what I use to build my email list and to send emails out. So ConvertKit is the thing where, now there are other companies that do this too, like SumoMe and other things. MailChimp is kind of a competitor with ConvertKit. But if you go to a website and a thing pops up and says, hey, put your email address in here and we'll give you this PDF or just get these tips or something, ConvertKit does that too, manages all of it in one package. I love it. It's a great system. It's kind of new on the market, but I think it's going to take over. So ConvertKit is another tool that I use. And then I use Google Analytics. You can't see this, but this is a list of the most popular posts on my blog. Now what I did is I looked at the posts that I was putting out on my blog, and I noticed things like, huh, 
this one post about how to become a writer at Forbes is really popular. In fact, it's so popular, it's more popular than the next 10 posts on my blog. So I can see that people are really interested in that type of content, and then I can produce more of that type of content. That's the kind of simple insight that Google Analytics gives me. Helps me to know what I should focus on, what's popular, what's not popular. So those are some of the basic tools I've used to create influence with my market. Now let's talk about content. So I told you, I wrote this article, Four Tips for Hiring an SEO Firm. This blew up. It's got, as of the other day, it was 120,000 views that have been come to this. It's been two years that it's been up. It still generates all sorts of leads for me. I probably spent two hours writing this, and I've got, again, millions of dollars of revenue from this one article alone. If you had an influencer in, in your company who was writing content like this, explaining to people how to buy your product, your service, in a very comfortable, human way, familiar way with your customers, what could be, that be doing for your company? This is content that I created the other day on my blog, The Ultimate CMO Resource. I was researching for my book, and I collected all this information, and so I put all this information that wasn't part of the book, but was foundational research for helping me write the book. I put this all on one blog post, and I stick it out there, and then I add to it as I find more information. It's got all the journalists who cover CMOs. It's got all the major CMO organizations. It's got links to anything and everything to do with the chief marketing officer role. And now this is becoming a resource. It's indexing really well on Google and showing up. And so this drives constant traffic to my blog. This is called evergreen content. Three years from now, this will be just as valuable as it is today. Five years from now, this will still be driving traffic because I'm going to keep it updated. If you want to be a B2B influencer, you need to create evergreen content like this that continues to drive value over the long term. I love SlideShare. Now, if you had come to me a few years ago and you said, there's this website, it's called SlideShare. It's kind of like YouTube, except it's PowerPoint presentations. I would have thought, huh, well, that's exactly what I want to do on a Friday night. I want to go look at PowerPoint presentations online. I don't want to do that anytime. Why would I ever want to go look at PowerPoint presentations if I had the choice? I mean, that's what you're forced to do in meetings, right? And yet this website gets tens of millions of visitors every single month, and you can do marketing through SlideShare and get amazing results. This presentation here, Major PR Exposure Without ma Major Media, I put that up. It's got 65,000 views. That's 65,000 people who know who I am now, who didn't know who I was before, and all I had to do was take a presentation I had created anyway for a conference like this, and I just stuck it up there. I didn't do anything else. I tweeted it out. I put it on LinkedIn. I did simple little things that take five minutes, but I didn't do much else. 65,000 views. That's a lot of influence for not much investment. So now taking your content to the next level, getting a little bit more involved, is this. Why every C-level exec should publish a book right now? So the way that we used to look as bo at books was as a legacy type thing. So here's Jack Welch. He's got his book, Jack, straight from the gut. The way that books used to work was you had a successful career, and then you retire, and then you write this book, and that's how you cement your legacy. That's how people remember you. But that's the way it used to be. Oh, by the way, if you get an endorsement, you don't want Warren Buffett saying Jack is the Tiger Woods of management. That could really be taken in an odd way today. But so it used to be a legacy that you wanted to create with a book, but today it's about thought leadership. The book is the new business card. If you're going to be an influencer, your book is the cost of entry to being an influencer. It's not what you do after you're an influencer, it's what you do when you're becoming an influencer. So you need to have a book, it's just a given, it's just a basic. And with self publishing today, it's super easy to get a book out there. Now, some people say, oh, but I need to be older. I need to have more experience before I can be an influencer. Here's Nathan Latka. He started his first business when he was 22 or something. Actually, he started his first really successful business when he was around 21, 22. Now he's this huge podcast host. He has millions of listeners. He's a huge marketing, entrepreneurship, startup influencer. I don't think he's even 30 years old yet. He's just a young kid, but he's got tons of influence. Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a huge influencer. He's barely 40 years old. He's got a bunch of best-selling books out there. He's got an agency with 700 people in it. He's a huge, huge influencer. He gets paid 120,000 US to give a 20-minute talk. That's how big of an influencer this guy is. 
Is he old? No, he's not old. He's a young guy. Same with Tim Ferriss. When he wrote The 4-Hour Workweek, he was about 30 years old. He wasn't a successful guy with a huge legacy. He was a young guy. You don't have to be old. You don't have to have a big track record to write a book. What you need to have are good thoughts that deliver value to people, stuff that people want to know. So my book, Chief Marketing Officers at Work, the reason I wrote this wasn't because I was an expert on CMOs. It wasn't because I knew a lot about CMOs. I didn't know anything about CMOs. That's why I wrote the book. The reason I wrote the book or what sparked it was here I am. I'm running a digital marketing agency and one day I walk into a client, he, client's office here in Hong Kong and we were there to sign a deal. We were going to start this engagement with this client. We we're going to kick things off. All we had to do was get that little signature on the contract and then we we're going to start. And I walk into the meeting and there's this new woman sitting in there. I've never seen her before, but she looks like she kind of owns the room and I'm thinking, uh oh, this is trouble. And we started to do our presentation. She said, wait, 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 wait. Let me introduce myself. My name's Hope Frank. I'm the new CMO here. And by the way, all marketing's on hold until I figure out what's going on in this company. And we went, oh, man, killed that deal. We walked out of there and I thought, man, if we had just come in here a week earlier, got that deal signed, she couldn't have stopped it. We would have had this deal. And I walked out of there thinking, I need to know more about CMOs and I need to understand CMOs better because these people can kill our deals, they can kill our business. And so I went back to my team and I said, what should we do so that we can understand CMOs better and really get on their good side? And I thought, well, I should write a book. I like writing. I'm writing all these Forbes articles. Why don't I write a book on what CMOs need to know about digital marketing? And then I started to write this book and I realized I don't know anything about CMOs. I'm writing this book for an audience I don't understand. I need to understand CMOs better. Well, I had read a book years before called Founders at Work. And I knew it was part of a series. They have CTOs at work and venture capitalists at work and lawyers at work. So I thought, hey, they got CTOs at work. They must have CMOs at work. I'll go read CMOs at work and then I'll understand CMOs and then I can write my book. I went looking for CMOs at work. It didn't exist. So I found the publisher's website. I'm trying to figure out where this book is because I was convinced it had to exist. And then I noticed they had this little blurb on the book website saying, hey, why don't you write for us? And I clicked on this link and it took me to a page and said, anybody can write a book for us. You just have to send us a proposal. So I sent them a proposal and I said, hey, I want to write CMOs at work. What better way for me to get to understand CMOs than to go interview 30 of them and put this book together? And then I'll have the book too. So that's what I did. I got the contract. I interviewed the CMOs. I've got the book. It's coming out soon. So this book's not even out yet. It hasn't been published. It's up for pre-sale on Amazon. But the book's not even out yet and I'm already getting podcast interviews. I'm getting interviewed for magazine articles. I'm getting influence. I'm getting results from a book that doesn't even exist yet. That's how good of a tool or how valuable a tool like a book is for your career. And nobody cares that I'm not an expert on CMOs or at least that I wasn't before I wrote the book. They care that the book has good content. So let's put this all together real quick. So who should your influencer be within your company? Definitely the head influencer should be the CEO, which is hard because your CEO is super busy and he doesn't like to write and he doesn't like to talk in front of video and he's just running around and he's got all sorts of excuses, right? But that's who it should be. Look at Richard Branson. Look at these other people. These people have time to be influencers. Richard Branson's huge. You think he's not busy? He runs like 50 companies and yet he still finds time to write, to be on video, to do all sorts of creative stuff. The CEO should definitely be the influencer in the company. But if you can't get the CEO, get another exec, get whoever you can to be the face of that company. What kind of content should the CEO or whoever the influencer for your company create? They should create the kind of content your customers want. How do you know what it is? Go ask them. And then try stuff. Throw content out there. Test it out. Your customers will let you know what kind of content they want and what they don't want. Too often what we do instead is we say, we need a blog on our website. Why do you need a blog? Because everybody else has one. Okay, we're going to throw out a blog. That's not the way to go. The blog is the channel. The blog is not the content. And you need to get the content right first. What's the kind of content that you're going to produce? Maybe for your company the right kind of content is a lot of question and answer type of content. Maybe you have a technical product and people have lots of questions 
they need to get Q&A type stuff. Is a blog the best forum to do Q&A? Maybe video is better. So maybe video should be your channel. And then you say, what's the sub-channel? Well, should it be Snapchat, should it be Instagram, should it be YouTube? But ask your customers first. Find out where they're going to find the type of content that you figure you should be producing at your company. And again, the channel, it's the one that your customers are on. What are they using? Don't try to force your customers into a channel that they aren't already using. That's hard. It's a lot easier to figure out what they already use and then go there. Chris talked about LinkedIn, what kind of content goes on LinkedIn. It's business content. If you're trying to force your business content through a channel where it's not that kind of context, it's not that audience, you're going to struggle. However, my caveat is if you don't feel comfortable with a certain type of channel, do some whatever you feel comfortable with. So for example, you might find out that we're going to produce a certain type of content, Q&A or whatever, and video is really the best way to deliver this to our audience. That's what our customers want. However, your CEO or whoever the influencer is going to be hates video, is terrified by video, or is just terrible on video. So then you say, well, that's just not going to work. Yeah, video would be best, but that's not where our influencer is going to do a good job. Maybe your CEO loves writing, so get him a blog, get him writing. So it's more important to do something instead of nothing, and it's better to do something in a less than ideal channel, even if it's not the best channel for your audience. So that's it. Any questions? I know that was a really high level overview. I could dig into details on 20 different things about this, but hopefully that gives a good foundation for how to get started on B2B influencer marketing. Yeah, any questions? Questions. I have one. Yep. Um, I, I was quite intrigued by um, the articles that you were posting, for example, on how you started uh, writing on, on Forbes, for example. If you could let us know a little bit more of, of the little tricks that that you were explaining in those articles that worked so well. Um. Yeah. Well, it's funny. When I started writing, I just thought, well, I'm going to write stuff and I'm going to throw it out there. And I started writing big blocks of text. And then you start picking up on all these little tricks like, oh, the headline actually matters. Because when people read that headline, it sells what's in the article. And if the article doesn't deliver what's in the headline, then people feel like they got ripped off somehow, even though it's free. So. I started really paying attention to headlining, putting a lot of thought into every single word of that headline. And then I started getting more response from that. And I started breaking up my text. So it wasn't just big chunks, big paragraphs of text, but there were images in there, and bold text, and lists of bullets. And I started looking at websites like Copyblogger and other websites that tell you how to be a better writer. And I started figuring out these tricks. The other interesting thing is you might assume you might li listen to me and say, well, this is all well and good, Josh, but you got lucky enough to get on Forbes, so of course you're able to do this stuff. We can't do that because we're not on Forbes. I've had articles that I wrote on Forbes, and I published them, and then they got two or 3,000 views, which is great, right? Then I copied and pasted that article and p put it up on LinkedIn Pulse, which is free, which anybody can post on, and it gets 15,000 views on LinkedIn Pulse and a bunch of comments. So sometimes the platform or the channel isn't as great as you think it is or it's a lot better than you think it is. In this case, sometimes Forbes is not as good as LinkedIn Pulse. This exclusive platform is not necessarily better just because it's exclusive. So there's a lot of value on platforms like LinkedIn and Medium where you can post content for free and anybody can post. You can actually generate sometimes a lot more response there, get a lot more influence there than even if you're able to write for a publication like Forbes or something. One more question comes to mind. When it comes to influencing, um, um, should someone like a CEO um, give uh, just one single image of themselves uh, and, and very linked to their company? Or is it coherent for someone, for example, to write about business and on a parallel side write about climbing or marathons or something like this? Or does it give any kind of incoherence? How, how to manage the different aspects that a person might have? I think it depends on the details. So, I mean, every situation is different. But there's definitely something to be said for being authentic and real. And if you look at Richard Branson, you look at other influencers, some of which Chris mentioned in his presentation, a lot of these successful influencers 
are very human and they talk about things that are near and dear to their hearts. They're very vulnerable, they're very accessible, and that comes across as very authentic. You can't fake that very well. And so those people tend to be listened to and they have more influence than people who are very on message, very corporate, running everything through the legal department. Legal departments are the killer of authenticity when it comes to influence marketing. So the worst thing to do is to say, oh, we're going to set up the CEO as an influencer, but everything that is going to be written is actually written by this team over here, and then it goes through legal, and then we just put the CEO's name on it. That's not influencing. That is just more corporate stuff. It's the same type of stuff people say that they hate when it comes to content. So if it were me, yeah, I would put the CEO out there or the leader out there, and I'd have them writing about all sorts of stuff, including personal stuff. Now, there was another presentation today where he said there's this 80-20 rule between personal content and business content. You need to come up with some sort of rule like that where you say, well, let's keep this 50-50 you know, or 70-30 or 75-25, but you want to have some sort of ratio between personal content and business content. And if it's going to be a business context, it's probably going to be mostly business-related content. But when I say business-related content, I don't mean selling. I don't mean about the company. I mean it's related to your business somehow. I don't write content about my agency. I don't talk about my agency. I talk about things that are related to my agency. I tell people how to do SEO. I don't then say, oh, by the way, you should come hire my agency because we're great at this. I just tell them how to do SEO. I know that if they really are interested, they'll come find me somehow. I don't have to do that pitch. And CEOs shouldn't do that either. Ron. Oh, wait. You're not Ron. You look like Ron. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Uh, question. Uh, this is how do you leverage on your own employees to mm -hmm. get like, more exposure and more money? Like, do you have your own uh, this is where I can empathize with anybody who's struggling. If you're in marketing and you've been looking at this type of stuff and you're like, we've been trying to do this, but we just can't get the executives on board with it. That's how I feel with the rest of my team. So I want everybody on my team to be an influencer. I want them to be out speaking and writing and doing things on social media. And it's just for some people and it's not for other people. And what I try to do is I try to give people the vision of what's possible and then the tools to make it happen. But it's got to come from them. And that's the real challenge is you can't force this. You can't go to a CEO and say, all right, we're going to turn you into an influencer because if he doesn't want to do it, if she doesn't want to do it, it's just not going to happen. And we've seen that over and over again with executives that sometimes they're just not into it. And, but sometimes it's because they don't believe it will work. Other times it's because they're really not into writing, they're really not into video. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you had the 80-20 rule, yeah. Um, actually, I really like what you're talking about because it, it goes in exactly the same direction of what I've been saying, meaning using LinkedIn for building your profile. It doesn't actually necessarily help help you directly, but it builds your credibility as an influencer in your company. Now for my question, if, if you look at that rule, I believe 85% are probably not making the most people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you have any tools, any suggestions, any platforms that people can use to write their book and get some help to, to make it really? Well, there's one tool, which is Grammarly. So you can put any text into Grammarly, and it will sort things out, not just spelling, but also grammar and things like that. So that's a helpful tool. But if you're not a nat native English speaker and you're going to create content in English, especially a book where, yes, you can, it's amazing how much work goes into a book. Now, having written a book myself, and I didn't even write it, I just interviewed people and then transcribed it. So much work goes into writing a book that I have mad respect for anybody who's written any book. I don't care how bad it is. There's so much work that goes into that. And no matter how much work you put into a book, there are going to be errors in that book. You look at classics that are world famous books, you can still find typos and errors in those books, even though 10 editors may have gone through that book. And when somebody finds a single error in that book, they say, oh, man, 
can't believe they left this error in this book. I mean, come on, like, how could they not see this? And yet, it's amazing how much work can go into it and still those errors sneak through. So no matter what you do, it's not going to be perfect. However, you want it to be as perfect as possible, right? So the one piece of advice is get an editor. You need to have a native editor in whatever language you're publishing in, and that editor needs to go through that content and oversee it. So you can come up with the idea, the framework, write the rough draft and everything, but if you're not an English speaker and you're going to write in English, get an English speaking, native English speaking editor and have them go through it and clean it up. That's really the only solution until AI progresses to the point where it <laughs> edits everything for us. And then it'll progress to the point where it writes everything for us and then we'll all just relax on tropical islands and do nothing, right? Until they kill us. Yes. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.